Wow, welcome everyone. Uh, it was very nice to, uh, to see all of you uh, here. Um, students, artists, dignitaries, uh, you're all equally welcome to, uh, to PRIO uh, for this uh, very interesting seminar, Par Parallel Histories of Palestine Art, Archive and Solidarity. Uh, and I think this is by now maybe the 12th episode of the Inspire Seminar Series. Some of you, I think, may have uh, attended all 12 of them. Um, my name is Cindy Horst, and I'm a research professor here at PRIO and also the co-director of the Center on Culture and Violent Conflict. Um, the Inspire Seminar Series is part of a research project, and we study uh, what inspires artists to engage in creative practice during and after conflict. Uh, the project led by Kasia Gabska is funded by the Research Council of uh, Norway and it's a collaboration with the CCC. And we work together with artists uh, and activists in Myanmar, in Sudan, uh, and people with lived experience who uh, create art and are based now in Europe, including in Norway. Um, today, I have the great pleasure, not just to introduce, but actually also to go into conversation with Ayman al uh, whom I met last year uh, when you were part of a residency in Oslo, which was a collaboration between PRIO and Praxis Uslo. Uh, Ayman uh, was at the uh, Art Academy in Oslo, Kio, and you also studied film in in Hebron, in Palestine, and you create films, photos, mixed media art, and your work has been screened worldwide, uh, including in the City Hall in Oslo, I want to mention, because you can actually, uh, that, that is a place you uh, will all be able to, uh, to visit. Uh, Ayman will start by introducing some of his projects, so we get a bit of a sense of the different uh, projects that uh, he has been uh, creating. Uh, but then after that, we'll have a conversation, uh, which I think is very inspiring to see, uh, first of all, to hear the very special story of the archive and how you came across that archive, but also then how you as an artist uh, plan to use uh, uh, and work with uh, this archive. So, um, Ayman, the floor is yours, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about your projects. I mean, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I will start a bit back to 2000 when I finished my study in the art college in, or like film college in Hebron, Al Khalil, and I started working in Ramallah with uh, in a TV channel called Al Istiqlal, uh, and I started working as a journalist or like cameraman and documentary film, and then I was going around all the time. You know that was the second Intifada time, so was going you know just through checkpoints, gates, making reports, documentary films, uh, these kind of things uh, all the time. And then during that I get like, that was like a really kind of like tough time during the second intifada was a lot of blood. So, and there is no private life, I would say, like you need to be having your phone all the time. So they call you like there is something happened then you need to run and film it. And there is a lot of the blood hospitals. And then after that, or like during this time, I started like, okay, kind of with my friends, starting like going, started establishing a company called Idioms Film, working with film and photography and culture things, uh, you know, like beside my work in TV. But we started like basically in the beginning, we started like with just like easily with like photography and experimental photography, I would say, and just doing, I mean, you know, that was really tough time, second intifada and was like a lot of things happening. But then we decided to go against the news, I would say. And then we started like doing like practicing like photography and experimental, like how we do this, like with light and like the technique. Uh, the dynamic, the quality of lights, and how we, we do like images in a different way, and it was interesting period of our life and like filming all of all the times with my friends, and then we get in touch with an artist who said like, I mean you're doing a great job, so why you don't have an exhibition, and I mean we didn't thought of like doing any art exhibition. It was just like to get out of this TV 
documentary films that we're doing all the time and working with it. So we started with uh, the first exhibition was like basically, and this is maybe during the 2002, 2003, and that was the first exhibition in uh, Al Khalil uh, Art Center in Ramallah. And we did uh, uh, a group show with another two artists or a friend. And we called it Journey. And that was like nothing to do with the Intifada. And that was the first exhibition in 2002. Like artists do a, an exhibition, nothing to do with what's going on uh, in the street or what's going on like in a daily life. It's just like experimental light. I was interested in the sunset and the sunrise. So I was like all the time like taking pictures with dancers, like with movement during the sunset or the sun's uh, rise and see how that works. So after this exhibition, I was kind of like getting into this art world, which is like was first time for me, like knowing what's going on in the art world. And then it was like a bit of different than working in TV because in TV you work and you have like a schedule. There is like a boss that comes to you and say like, you need to do one, two, three. But this is, it's my ideas, it's my things that I'm doing. And I was like really happy about it. So I thought like, wow, this is interesting. So I, I, I have my freedom now. I can do things that I think it's interesting and I want to do it. And then I did, uh, I get a scholarship or like a, a, a small, very short, very small stipend to do an artwork, like the first solo show. And it call, I called it, uh, everything is okay. And basically it's talking about the time during the, the second, uh, or like when the Israeli invade uh, West Bank in 2002. And that time we were like almost sitting homes for like long time during that. So I asked a friend of me to sit in one room for like one week and see what he can uh, get up with it. Uh, you know, just like nothing with him. It's just like he can sit and eat and just do like other stuff. And I was filming him for 24 hours, like what he will do in this apartment alone without getting out. So like I was filming him during this and I did like an installation for that. And then uh, in, again in the in an, uh, in Al Khalil Art Center in Ramallah. And luckily after this, I went to the, I get a workshop with two Norwegian artists. And that was the starting of the art academy in, in Palestine. And this two Norwegian artists came to do a workshop with some artists from Ramallah. And in the end of it, they mentioned that there is a, they will give a two scholarship to artists to come to study in Norway. So I did apply for it and I get accepted uh, to the art academy. And then I came to Oslo uh, and a new period of my life, I'm here artist sitting in the art academy basically not knowing what i'm doing not knowing what i'm doing it's the first time uh, and it was a bit also surprised when i came this is it's a new country uh, you know uh, I, I kind of like didn't know anything about oslo beside oslo accord this is the only thing that i know i mean nothing's about norway at all uh, i mean the only thing that i know is like yeah we did the uh, oslo accord and that's that's it uh, so, and I was surprised when I came here. I mean, it was a very nice city. Everything is really new. But then I went after like one week when I came, I went to the UDE here in Oslo to do my residency. And then I was surprised when I get my residency, I was a stateless. And then I was like surprised. What's mean stateless? Like, what, what's that mean? You know, like I went to this girl, like I say, like, you know, like you did the mistake. I'm Palestinians. I'm from Bethlehem. You know, where is Jesus born? I'm, I'm born there. You know, I'm Palestinians. What's that mean, stateless? And she was like saying, you know, I know, but according to the, the laws here, I mean, you're stateless. You don't have a nationality. And I was surprised because in my passport, the first page, it's this passport issued because of Oslo Accord. And I was like, how is that possible? You know, how, how is that going to work? But then like, I was like, okay, this is Oslo again. Uh, but I didn't know anyone here in Oslo at all. I was like alone uh, doing my study in the art academy, not knowing any Palestinians. And by chance, I met this guy, his name is Saeed. He was like from Ramallah. He came here before me like four or five years, uh, asked ask for asylum. And he introduced me to the Palestinian few like Palestinians lived here. 
uh, from different places. I mean, all Palestinians, but some are from, from Lebanon, some are from Syria. And I was surprised, like, this is also first time for me when I meet Palestinians ask for asylum. They leave their country to ask for asylum in another country. I was like, why you want to do this? Like, what's, what's, for what reason you want to do it? And was surprised, like, all of them was, like, living in this apartment, not doing, not knowing what they are doing. Like, they just live. Uh, they are not fitting in the society. They don't speak Norwegian at all. Even they don't speak English. And then some of them, like, have a small work here and there. But they just like go around all the time and just like, okay. And I said like, that's a good uh, start project for me. And also for me as coming from like a TV background that was easier to start with like kind of a film. So I decided to go and follow this guy, which is his name Saeed, and just ask him basically what, why? I mean, what's the, why you want to come to, to Norway? What's, what, what you find in Norway interesting to come to ask for asylum? Why you want to leave Palestine? And, you know, like when, while sitting with these guys, it's always they talking about Palestine. Nobody was talking about Norway n at all. Like we sit and just like talk about Palestine, Palestine. So uh, I follow him for like uh, a few months and I did this uh, short film. It's six minutes uh, and a half and it's called Passport. Uh, and this idea of a traveling and the passport, how much it's important, it was like a bit interesting for me because this is the first also first time I, I traveled like first time 2006 to come to Norway and then I find it very interesting when I was in the art academy how much easy to travel like in Europe like people just like yeah I'm going to Germany and then just stay there. And then when I just with these people like around and then like I realized how much important like to have a passport which has allowed you to, to travel and just like to, to go everywhere like nobody will ask you a question and for me coming from Bethlehem I was working in Ramallah and that that trip from Bethlehem to Ramallah every day it was like a nightmare, you know, like it's like I need to spend really hours just in checkpoints every day because I need to travel and then like you need to move to Ramallah to live in Ramallah and then like you need to visit your family every once a month because like you will spend all day like in this like small like trip, which is like it's basically one hour and then I was with a friend and he was from Gaza and he get, want to get to married and then he want to invite his family to come to, 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 to his wedding in Oslo and it was a bit of like super difficult like to, how to get them outside of from Gaza to 2008 was like really really difficult and then I was like but how are we gonna do it like why which way to do that there, there was no way and then I realized that, okay, but, you know, like, we had an airport, like, 2000, and we, what's happened to that airport? Where, why we cannot travel directly to Gaza and, like, our people? So I went and I started, like, doing a research about the airport and traveling, and then I realized that uh, Palestine had, the second Arab country had an airport after Egypt, and then they have long history with airport. And of course, like after the incubation, everything was destroyed. And like we have like uh, Kalandia Airport until like 67, I think. After the, the war in 67 was like even destroyed and occupied. So after that, we didn't have any airport. So I was thinking, okay, maybe it's a good idea. And we have uh, a Palestinian Airways Limited, which is, was the, the official like company, which is, was under the British, of course, mandate at that time. But they created this. Uh, so I decided to do like an kind of a fake international Gaza International Airport with Palestine Airways Limited, which is basically it looks like a company. Like if you go to the internet, you find it there as a website, and you could like go through like I want to choose this day I'm traveling from Oslo to Palestine, and then you go through and you need to pay, and then of course you don't pay, but you get your ticket, and then you don't travel to anywhere. Uh, <laughs> it's just like, you know, like, uh, here is your ticket and just like do whatever you like to do with it. But in the website also you could see, I mean, you could read about the long history of the airport. You could see like the ticket that was issued in, in, in 37 and thir after that and 48 and before that. So it was like also that one of the projects that I was thinking like, okay, that's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and then after this, I was finishing my school 
And after this, I was kicked out of Norway because I didn't have, you know, when you finish your school, you need to find work and, you know, all these like questions about like how to want to live. And then they kicked me out of the country. So I went back, but I was like having my girlfriend, my wife now. And then like one month after, and I get a letter from the UDE say like, yeah, you get residency, your residency now, you just, you can come back. And they like, there is something between me and Oslo. Like there is always like some relation because when I was a student in the high school in Palestine, I was dreaming to leave Palestine to go to study somewhere else. And Oslo Accord came and everybody was talking about it. And it was like a big thing. And I remember that when I was a child, you know, like everybody was talking about like now after Oslo, everything will change. You will have your identity, your passport. You can travel anywhere you want. But of course, after we have Oslo Accord, that was like kind of the opposite. It, everything's become more limited. Like we have like area A, area B, which is those who knows Palestine, you know, like area A, it's under the Palestinian authority. Area B, it's like half, half. Area C, it's like under the Israeli control. So we couldn't travel. So I came to Norway and then a friend of me from Ramallah, they called me and said like, you know, we're doing a project, it's 20 years of Oslo Accord and we're asking artists, 10 artists from Palestine to do an art project about Oslo. So I was sitting and back with my history and just like remembering how I remember Oslo. So I just made a film about like how I kind of like get stuck with Oslo like since I was like child Oslo came I thought like this is the, mo the moment that I will leave and will be free but it didn't work and then I get scholarship to Oslo and then kick me out of Oslo back <laughs> to Ramallah and then I get back here uh, so I did this, uh, this uh, project which is called Oslo Syndrome it's a film it's, uh, it's around like five minutes uh, maybe we watch a bit not all of it but uh, and it was part of like bigger project it was like 10 short films from different artists from all over the world like everybody have his opinion about how he see Oslo yes and after I mean after this project I was living here in Oslo so I was more like getting into what's going on here like in, in Norway and in, in, in Europe and then was of course like the the Syrian war and the crisis in Syria happening. And there was like a big discussion about like the refugees coming to Europe. And you know, like this is, was a big discussion in the media here and everybody like, and also was a Trump time also, you know, like everybody's talking about like closing the border and making new walls. Like everybody like don't want to have this like refugees coming and you sit like watching the TV in Norway. Like, yeah, then we will get like a hundred thousand of Syrian and we don't know how to do with it and what we can do with them, like why and how we can, you know, all these kinds of things. And I was like sitting and uh, with a friend of me, he's a Swedish guy, we did this project together in collaboration, was sitting and trying to say like, what's, what's going on guys? You know, like it's nobody's talking about like this crisis in terms of like a human, like there is a human dying in this war. Like they're like trying to cross the sea and dying in the sea. And it seems like nobody kind of care about them. So we decided to do a project about it, but then we decided to go more into like, what's the basic things for us as a human, which is, it's like, you know, it's the heart. And like, when you have like the baby, then go to the doctor, first things you check, it's the heartbeat. So we decided to go to the Zatari refugee camp, which is, it's one of the biggest Syrian refugee camp in Jordan and record the heartbeat from the refugees there and then convert it to vibration and make something called, we call the project called wall one, which is basically, it's look like a wall. Uh, inside this wall, it's like a vibration. When you touch it, it vibrates as a heartbeat. So with time touching it, so you feel like it's kind of sync with your heart. So like it's make it more like a human. And then you will realize, yeah, it's behind this wall. It's a human like us, like everyone. So we did this project called wall one. It's nothing to do with Palestine, but it's just like one of uh, my, uh, projects that I did uh, and we did exhibit it many different places in Europe even uh, yeah so this is a short introduction of my art uh, a bit not uh, not every project that I did I mean there is some other project but now we go to the conversation about the archive yes 
So, I mean, this was incredibly impressive and gives a bit of a background in uh, who you are and what you've done. Um, but uh, I've already heard this story. You told us the story during the, the residency. Uh, it's a really amazing story. So start by telling the story of the archive, please. The story of archive. In 2010, I was living in a student house not far away from here in the center of Oslo in Tulil Lokka. And then one night I went to the basement to, to get something or to put something, I don't remember. And when I went to this basement, there was a big room where they put everything that they need to throw away. But this room was full of like paper, like photo on the ground, like paper photos. And then I, you know, I'm a photographer, so I was interested. I need to look at it. And then I looked, I thought like, okay, I know these images, you know, I mean, these images, it's something that I really know. Uh, so I picked the second one, then the third one, and then it was like, you know, I mean, yeah, these places I know. I mean, this is like, as for example, this is Ramallah, uh, where is the Muqata'a now? And then I dig into this and I found a huge amount of like negative uh, images with boxes and a lot of like uh, Frit Palestina uh, magazine and a lot of like other like paper images printed. So I thought, okay, what to do now? So. So I uh, I decided to take everything. So I went into this room. I took everything. I went back to my room. I hide it in my in the room. Don't even touch it. Don't looked at it. And I was thinking in my mind, like, I mean, why and how is that possible to have this photo in this place? Like, the, I mean, this is a student house. There was a Palestinian student live here. There was like a people working with BLO. It might be like Israeli spies or like you know Mossad do something I didn't I was really afraid so like for the f two weeks I was every day in the morning when I go to the school I go down to the basement and check if there is something happened and back at night I go down to the basement and try to figure out and anybody write something anybody want this archive and then I decided after like two weeks I start like at night look at the images I went to the art academy I borrowed uh, a projection so I was looking to this like negative and these images uh, and then I find, and uh, yeah, so I was like, yeah, this is like people, like it seems working with Palestine, you know, like doctors, uh, you know, many of them, I don't know, but yeah, it's, uh, but then I found one image, which is, uh, yeah, you see like Yasser Arafat, like, you know, it's like very close to him and he was like doing, I said like, that should be like very strange, but then I found this image, uh, uh, yeah, this image which is his, uh, Nidal Hamad. And I know him before, so I thought like, yeah, I know this guy, I know him very well. And then I said, I went to him and I said like, Nidal, I mean, do you know this man? I said like, this is me. And I said, okay, tell me, uh, how is that possible? Like, you know, I found this archive and he told me the story that Palestina committee have, have an office there. So when they moved, they forget their archive there. And I left. So, <laughs> so I thought, okay, so now I know where to go and ask for it, you know. So I went to Palestina Comité and I start like digging in more into the archive and asking more questions about the solidarity movement when it started. Uh, I mean, this is, was also like for me was first time that I knew that uh, there is a solidarity movement in Norway. And this solidarity movement is very, very old. It's like older than me. I mean, these people working with, with, with BLO or like with Palestine since 60s, like in the end of 60s, beginning of 70s, and, and some of them until today working with it. It's really amazing. And then I start like going, and every time you go and you meet someone and you talk, so you get more archive. So like you get another like package of like boxes of like negative images or like another like something. Uh, and then I just, yeah, I took to Nidal Hamad and he gave me some of his archive and I talked to other people, but the story was very like, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was going to, um, uh, to a second hand shop in Oslo uh, after like two, two, three years to buy something to my home uh, with my wife. And then I found this, uh, yeah, this uh, in this place, like two box of negative in this second hand shop, I told him like how much it cost and he said like 100 kron. So I bought them and I went home without even look at it, you know, just like, okay, what will happen, you know, like it's 100 kron. And after I looked at it and it's all from Palestine, 
but this time it's from the other side, which is like Norwegian working with the Israeli or like, you know, uh, helping them or doing sake. Like you could see like this is it's kind of an official like uh, celebration of uh, opening uh, something in, 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 in West Bank, maybe settlement or something. Um, you see like this is kind of like uh, it's kind of a collaboration. Like, you know, this is uh, in memory of a trick of the, the later prime minister of Norway. Uh, yeah, and then I went. Uh, I like as I said, like I talked to Nidal Hamad. Uh, you know, he was. Uh, uh, yeah, and then he gave me this like book, which is called Al Maraka, and this is it's like it's an issued like it's a kind of a newspaper that uh, BLO did like issues in the war in eighty two, for the period of the war. It was like there, and it's he have all of it like so all the books is like about it. Uh, and I know the story of the war, but without details, I was like almost three years old. So I know like from the news or like songs about Beirut, but I never like read all these things about it. What's what's happening there, you know, like see like Norwegian doctor wasn't uh, hearing the story of like Norwegian was inside like the camps in Beirut and during the war and what they did. And, you know, like even the story of Nidal Hamad that two nurses took him from the hospital outside before Sabra Shatel, all this interesting story. But inside the archive also was many things which is very interesting. Like basically, like I find like you know this exhibition which is was uh, here in eighty one uh, at Kunstrandshus, where was Palestinian artist was invited to come to exhibit, uh, and this is the poster of the exhibition. And then they did the exhibition here, and I think in another uh, uh, area in Oslo or like in another place in Norway. Yeah. And then I went, I talked to another guy, and this guy, he came and said, like, uh, and his name, Abu Yasser Timraz, he's Palestinian, he lived here for a long time. So I was talking to him about, like, if he knows anything about the movement, because he's very, like, he came, like, in the end of 60s, beginning of 70s, I think. So I say like, you know, I have this VHS tapes, five VHS tapes of uh, things called hearing of the war in Lebanon in 82, which is basically... It's after the massacre of Sabra Shatela and the war in Lebanon, the Norwegian solidarity movement did something called hearing where they invite everyone was or like like many people was involved in that in Lebanon. They were like as a doctor, journalist, journalist to come to Oslo to give their witness about what's happening in, 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 in Beirut or in Lebanon and especially about Sabra Shatela. And he just like handed to me this like VHS tapes, which is like almost 15 hours of people from all over the world coming to Oslo at SAS Hotel, giving their witness uh, with documentation, with images, with films. Like you could see like the Swedish TV comes and just like have a film about Rashidiya camp. They did it before the war, like or a few months before the war started. So I was like, every time I go and meet someone, so they have more archive uh, for me. <laughs> Since 2010 until today, I'm still collecting uh, more archive. And then I kept collecting these materials. Now I have enough materials. So <laughs> I'm working toward like an exhibition in November. Uh, but also, as I said, like inside the archive, it's like really like many interesting things. So for example, like I found in this archive, which is like, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, like article and about Hani Jawhariya, he's like Palestinians. He's like one of the founder of Palestinian Film Unit in Beirut in in seventies, and then when I look to the more like I mean this is like really it's really amazing to read like in in seventy seven in Oslo they even screened these films and it was here for like sometimes, but also I find like the script the original script of like his films, and I was like saying like how is that possible like to to find this like original script which is basically it's it's I mean the whole like film is not existed anymore it's like get destroyed or like it's not uh, I mean you could find some copies here and there but like the original it's like get destroyed during the war in Lebanon so like what to do with it with with all this material that you have and and feel like I feel like so responsible for it it's just like you know it's so heavy and there is many cases inside it you need to I mean like it's like you have like 10 different art projects to work with it inside this uh, archive. Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite overwhelming. Just, I mean, it's very interesting to hear the story and also really overwhelming to uh, to see the kind of material you have. 
Uh, one of the things that I'm wondering, um, it's very interesting, of course, at Prio we have people who work as historians and they work with archives in particular ways. You're an artist. Um, what does that mean in terms of how you can and want to relate to the archive? Um, you're saying you feel responsible, you have a role. What would that role be for you as an artist? You know, it's very... I mean, it's very important and it's it's very responsible. So, like, the, I mean, I, I don't know what's the role of the artist for it. It's just like, for me, I feel like I'm responsible and it's like, it's very interesting, like, to collaborate. I mean, this is one of the good things about archive. Mm -hmm. It's just to give you this chance, like, to make a collaboration. So, like, you could go and sit with activists that they did this, like, works for, like, a long time and then during that like you meet an another one like who do research like you know like and you sit with them and just like see the academia how they look at it and then so or every time you meet people working with this movement or solidarity or this like we have relation to the archive you learn something of it but of course in the same times you feel this responsibility responsibility for it the ethic responsibility i mean this these people, they give their life for this, uh, this works. I mean, Palestinians and even the region, they did like a lot of work to, to do this, uh, to make this happen. And now coming as an artist, how you want to present it to the people, in which way you will make it visible to them somehow, and f with respect to the effort that the Norwegian did, and respect to the Palestinians and the effort that the Palestinian did at that time, and respect to those who sacrifice for it. You know, like there is like many like people died for this case. And like, it's not an easy thing. This is why it took me so long to, to kind of like, you know, every time I look at it and I feel like, you know, like, oh, wow, this is like so amazing work and it's really heavy. Like how I want to put it in the wall and just say like, yeah, it's really nice. You know, like it's really nice image, this one. But like, it, it have a lot of a story behind it. You know, it's have like, uh, a, long long history and then like it's uh but you know like as an artist i think like it's very important like to kind of highlight about these things and it's important like also like to go and to create our new narrative about it and try like to make it accessible to the other generation like comes after us and like say look okay yeah this people did something about it and have created something about it and make it accessible to everyone that who can he want to do or she want to do something about it. So like it's there, it's uh, it's open source for everyone. It should be like so they can look at it and do something about it. Yeah, and of course, it's also really interesting what you're saying. I mean, there's the historical document, so there's the the film and some of the stuff that you showed, but the creative and the artistic stuff also seems to be quite impressive. That at that time there was so much already going on. So I don't know, did that mainly come from initiatives, collaborations with Norway, or was it also a very strong movement from within Palestine to actually have these films created? And was it part of the kind of um, effort? Yeah, I think the Palestinians were there like very smart at that time. They decide, I mean, you know, like PLO, they were really, really like smart to, to, to decide it to, to, they want to make like a, a film unit, you know, because they kind of like knew that they need to have this in terms of like make this conflict globalized, you know, like that everybody knows about it. But in terms of like doing that, they knew that they need to collaborate with other people. So like it will never work. So like the film unit started in, in, in as I, I kind of like know, it started like in, in, in London where like some Palestinians filmmakers, they were studying there, they meet each other with other people. So they decided to start, they went to BLO, I mean, they have a relation. So they think they started from there. But also then this collaboration between like Norwegian going there, like other people. So like it make it maybe the collaboration between them was like much uh, in a practical way. So like they do things to, to each other. It's like, you know, like so like Norwegian comes to the, to the Palestinians. So they help in terms of like doing subtitling for the films. Like so like they get their copy. So they do the subtitling for the Palestinians or somehow. Uh, uh, in this way, but also like this is also like the great the, the great things about PLO at that time. You know, like 60s, 70s, where they create like a, a plastic department for art, and then they create like in six, I think 78 the first exhibition about Palestine or like international exhibition for Palestine, where they invited like 
a lot of artists or many artists from all over the world to come to Beirut to do an exhibition. Mm -hmm. But in return to that, they were like a collaboration. This is how they get invited to do an exhibition in, in, in Oslo. And then they get to do an exhibition in Japan. Then they did exhibition in, 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 in many different other countries. So mm -hmm. this was like kind of a collaboration in this way uh, all the time that's going on between them. Hmm. And I guess what's interesting is that that's set in the times in the 60s and 70s. And of course, an awful lot has happened now. At the moment, there's not this kind of cultural focus so much, or is is there still? I would not say like this. I mean, there is, but it's not as be before, or it doesn't have the same kind of like uh, lines. I, I would say it's completely different. It's also like you need to remember that was during the BLO time. It's more like an organization now we have an authority we have a minister of culture that every things need to go in a different way in a different mm -hmm. process it doesn't have the same kind of way how to do it so and then like in terms of the authorities like you know there is maybe some you know like different agendas like it's an authority that need to run the country in a different way than blo was so so it make it a bit different than before of course it's still there is maybe collaboration uh, but not as as now, uh, as before, like or like in sixties and seventies. Uh, but considering this is all quite sensitive, um, does the fact that you're an artist change anything about kind of what you are able to do with the archive? Um, does it give you greater liberty in? Because of course, any history that's told, even if it's an archive, it's told from many different perspectives, right? Uh, so you're sitting with an archives with I think it was very beautifully illustrated with the the two different archives you got from the solidarity movements in Norway. There's so many different stories you can tell. Um, does it help that you're an artist? Considering I mean I'm just thinking about okay the historian in the room who um, who who comes from a very different. Uh, you know like I mean the, the good thing I mean or the only things with artists that they could create things in a different way. I mean, historian, they look to the history as a fact and then they want to do something as a fact. This is what happened. This is what we get out of it. But for us, I mean, I don't need to think to look at it in this way. I could create my own fiction story about it and still tell the story about this. And there is many good examples about it, like, you know, like Walid Rad, the Lebanese guy who did like Atlas Group, which is basically it's a fiction story about the war that was in Lebanon. I mean, it's still the facts there, but he creates the whole story. Which is this is the good things about like artists working with archive that that they could create their own narrative about it, uh, but in this way also you kind of allowing other people to look at it and see like okay well if he did it in this way why I'm not I'm, I'm able to do it in my own way, so that's that's a good I think this is the only good things about make being artist and filmmaker like how I mean to create something out of it is just like it's your decision which way you need to, to go with it. It's just like, okay, I want to do like an exhibition and just having a photo, or I want to make like an installation where I want to, to add another like layer on it, or I want to just to make a sound piece of it, or I want to just interview someone and tell me the story of it. And there is like a different way to do it. But I mean, you know, I don't know like the historian here, they can tell, uh, <laughs> so they're sitting here, so both of them. Uh, I, as I know, like it's like they looking at it as like you know this is the fact, this is the history, this is what happened, this is what we get out of it, and that that's it. Or maybe they have a conclusion about it. Yeah. At the same time, one of the things that uh, you mentioned when we uh, we had a conversation about this earlier is that what for you is interesting is that this is your story, but it's actually uh, like the angle, the way that it's seen is totally different. Right, so it's it's seen from the solidarity movement, or it's seen from kind of an outsider perspective. Um, so, what does that do to your ability to work with uh, material? So, a lot of it is actually from Palestina Committee, from uh, Norwegians going into the solidarity. You no, know, in the beginning, I felt like yeah, I know the whole story about it. And when I look at it, you know, like I know I I I grew up with these songs about Beirut and all. You know, like Beirut, all these things, and I felt like, yeah, I know everything about it. But the minute that I sit, even with like Nidal Hamad, he's a Palestinian who lived in Beirut. 
I, I thought like, okay, I don't know anything basically. You know, I'm I'm a still uh, just a guy who know a little bit. And then when you sit with the region and you look at it, so you kind of like your perspective get bigger and bigger because this this conflict is not just about Palestine. It's like more and more and more. So they looked at it in a different way. The struggle was it's not just about like, I mean, of course, Palestine was the core of it, but the struggle was bigger than that. So, and the agenda was a different way. So when you look at it and sit with these people and you hear the story, then you feel like, even though it's my own story or my own struggle, but I don't know that much about it still. I mean, each time you meet someone and you sit with them and you just talk to them and then you realize that she's like, in 77, she traveled to Beirut and she was like sitting with Yasser Arafat and just like going from camp to camp to the place to the place and meet all these leaders and she know like things that I never know anything about. You know, like it make me like feel like, okay, I mean, this conflict is really big and, and it's, there is a lot of players in it that you need to discover. It's not just, you know, what we hear in the media. Uh, so this is the, the good things, I mean, the good things that you meet in the region, the solidarity, the people who work with the solidarity is just like every time you learn something new. It's also you, you learn a lot about like Oslo, so you learn about like Norwegian society, you know, like how I, how I get to know like there was like two Palestina committee, like was Palestina Front, was Palestina Committee, and there's like Maoist related to, to China, like communists related to, to Russia, and then there was a fight between them, but nobody knows, and then like clashes, and then, you know, the, so you, you kind of learn about like even the Norwegian society, the Norwegian culture, like how Norway moved from like the first, like of one of the first countries supported Israel to become like, I'm not saying like is 100% supporting Palestinian, but it's like moved more toward Palestinians in, in terms of that, like, you know, this is like, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of like things happening and during this period of time, you know. So like it's 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 bigger story than the things that I know, and it's a different lens that see things, you know. Like it's still like it's kind of the same picture, but it's the same different perspective. It add to the same image. I think for me that's also really interesting to look at this uh, fact. I mean, of course, we have these discussions now as well about what, uh, as an outsider, what are you contributing? What's your role? And to hear that, okay, you have different lenses, uh, and from that you can actually see things from different perspectives, but also to be really aware of these different lenses that you actually have. Um, but I'm seeing there's an awful lot of confidence in this room, and we still have half an hour. Um, what I was hoping, because there's so many stories that can be taught with the archive, um, but I was actually thinking it's quite useful to share that story with many different people, and to hear also from them um, what might be speaking to you. What did you find? Oh, that's a story that should be t uh, told. Or maybe you, even some of you might be inspired to tell some of these stories. I don't know whether you're willing to share parts of the, uh, the archive as well, but just to think a little bit more um, collectively. Uh, I mean, both there's room for questions, obviously, but also to uh, to hear some input, because um, I'm sure you're you're still thinking about what on earth to do with this uh, huge uh, well, huge some, archive. Well, but of course, it would be nice to hear and see what people think, and, and if there is anything so that that might be. Thank you. Hello, hi. My name is Abhijit. I'm a documentary photojournalist, and I also work with a lot of. Uh, still images and documentary uh, short videos as you presented. <clears throat> I can go on and on about your appreciation for your absolute still photography work that you did, but I'll, I'll save that for later. I have a question. <clears throat> uh, I've been waiting for this for at least 13 years to get into this movement. Uh, since my India days and uh, as a documentary photojournalist who is working in mixed media and who is also new uh, uh, to the conflict of course who has done secondary research a lot and reading most of it even today as you said there are so many different perspectives to it and lens from outside 
what is your suggestion to a person like me who would like to start a new or who would like to give a new lens uh, to this whole movement? Ah, that's a... I would say, like, get in touch with, with the people that started this and go with them. Just talk and talk and understand more and more. And through that, I mean, you will find what's really more interested you. Uh, so if you're interested, like, in, 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 in documentary photos, or maybe you will find it very interested and you go for it. If you're interested in, like, the human uh, perspective on these stories that we will tell, so you could, have, like, say, this is my way of looking at it. I mean, through, like, my experience, like, with this, I find, like, meeting people every time, it's like, the, this is the only way that you learn more and then you get more knowledge and then you get more uh, different perspective to the to the to the conflict to the archive to the movement in norway to the even to the social context in norway uh, of to oslo to, to different things so i would say like this is the only way it's just like you need to keep, be patient and just go for it and just like meet people did work with it uh, and read more of course just to understand what's going on in many different levels. Uh, thank you, Ayman. Um, my name is uh, Sune Hoppele. I'm a professor at Roskilde University in, in Denmark. And I'm a sociologist. And for the last uh, four or five years, I've been doing a project on Palestine solidarity, how it developed uh, in the world, but especially in Scandinavia. So it's uh, great to have found uh, someone with the same uh, interest and also really hearing uh, your approach to it, which of course is different from from mine as a scholar, and I th I, I think we can do a lot of good things together, like we talked about. Um, one reflection on on your talk is this question of uh, historians and artists and what they do sort of differently. I think your, your questions and conversations also led a little bit to that. I wouldn't say that. Um, that we as historians or social scientists necessarily just are interested in what happened. I think we're also struggling actually with this question of history and memory, right? So, and this goes a little bit towards talking about what the, this archive is. Uh, and I, I would like us to talk about that a little bit because you, you, you talk about the archive first as the box that you found. That was the archive that you stumbled upon. But can we make, can we be sure that that's actually an archive? I mean, what is an archive, right? I think the, the archive also becomes your, ar your, an archive in your effort to kind of put it together. And you talk about other things you buy or you collect, and that adds to your archive or the archive. And I think, um, you know, it is a creative effort to tell histories, and especially this history. And it's not, it's not a clear-cut thing what that history is, what story it is that we're trying to tell. It's not clear-cut for us as historians, because we, we have to make these kind of decisions as well. You could tell a story about how Scandinavian welfare societies discover a third world struggle and become interested and engaged in it and actually come to play a really big role. The Oslo process partly happened because of some of the work that Norwegian solidarity activists did, the connections they created that built connections to the uh, labor movement and through Norvak, the nurses that we saw in the pictures. It's a really interesting and hugely important story, right? But you could also tell other stories about it. You could tell stories about immigration and traveling, a bit like your earlier work. So there are real sort of big decisions for you and, and for me and for anyone sitting with this. What do we do with, with what we call the archive? And why do we have this sort of urge to put this archive together? That's, I think that's also interesting. So I think my straight question to you is, uh, which, which story do you think you want to tell with this? I mean, I'm, I'm also st I'm trying to write a book from this material. And I think my storyline goes in different directions still. So. Um, I'm really interested in that. Like uh, for me, I, I mean, we talked a little bit about it before, but then now with time working, I'm really more interested on the the personal story. So like the people work behind this archive, which they have the story. I I really want to get it to the people. I mean, you know, like this, especially Palestine cases. Every is like it's it's kind of known. Like people know about it, read about it, like know it, but nobody know about the personal history, like especially like let's say like Norway, this activist. I mean, of course, like many knows, but not everyone. 
So I'm really interested on in, in, in telling the story of those who did the work behind this archive. So like the story of those personal did the work. It's it's really like I'm interested in that. Of course, like as I said, like you know, like looking at the the, the Hani Jawhari is like script that I have. I mean, it's really interesting and just like you need to sit, read them, and say like, okay, I want to me maybe redo these films, you know, like or redo create a new film with the same script. But now in this moment, I would say like, okay, I want to really focus on this side of like the personal, these people, like especially that I work with now in Norway, I want to tell their stories uh, in a very simple way, I would say. It's just like to tell us what they found in the Palestinian case, what they, they thought of it and what they did for it and what they think about it now in, in, in this time. So I would say like this, but of course, as I said, like, you know, this could be like long, term of projects so, you know like you start with this and then it leads to the other things and it leads to that you know like it could be like 10 years art of collection of project and i'm getting the sense also that you are very interested in then doing that collaboratively with different people who are interested in part of the story right yeah, yeah i mean you know like we talked me and him and i and, and we we don't agree in, in many things but at least i know that we also like we were planning to do like maybe other like seminar or like conference to talk about the archive, the importance of the archive, what we do with this archive, like where to have it, like to have it in the internet, like to become like a public source to everyone, to send it to, to the national library, to give it, I mean, you know, like there is many different questions about it. So like it, it is important like to, to sit and talk to, like to collaborate and, and, and try to do something about it. Thank you, Jürgen Jenshaugen, uh, introduced as the historian in the room. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm so intrigued by this story, and the, we, we've talked about it before, but one thing that really struck me now is, of course, the, the thing that you know really hits you in the face is, is how upon chance you discovered this. But uh, as a historian, I, I mean, unlike Suna, my perspective is usually always sort of high top-level diplomacy where it's like the archive is like the White House archive. It's the State Department archive. It's typically like organized archives managed by well-established bureaucratic states. And your perspective is kind of contradictory to that in, in many ways. But one thing that just struck me now is that First of all, the PLO, it wasn't a state. Um, but unlike most national liberation movements, it had sort of a really good archival structure. But that was destroyed by basically Israel during the invasion in 82. So that archive is, is gone. I mean, it's a state in, in embryo that took real efforts to make an archive, and that archive was lost, destroyed, stolen, we don't know really where where it is in in totality. We we do know. I, c I can tell you where it is. It, it's <laughs> mostly in Tel in Jerusalem, or where it's is in it? In Tel Aviv with the with the uh, uh, IDFA, the, right. I, the Israeli Defense Forces archive. They copied the whole thing, and they won't show it to anyone. And the real one is in Algiers in an army base. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, so 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 yeah. This, this kind of confirms the point though, right? It's not in the typical place where you'd find it. And the other aspect here is, is, is the solidarity movements who are, you know, they do great work, but they're not famous for being bureaucratic organizations, at least not in their early phases. So in a sense, you've discovered, you have access to a story that it might not be structured in the same way as like a state archive. Um, but it's just really, really valuable because it's it's the type of information historians like me don't have access to at all. Um, and the, the 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 labor union archives in Norway, you know, they can have parts of this. But just like the, it just really shows how much of history happens by chance. At least like the unofficial history, the history from below, all of that really, really happens by chance. You know, somebody stumbles upon it. Uh, there's a basement left over. I mean, typical in, in a lot of, you know, the post-colonial African states where it's like it's, it's left to rot in an archive and then somebody stumbles upon it and saves it and makes a state archive out of it in a sense. Because in the chaos between one situation and the next in a civil war, you don't get a horde of historians that go in and, and create shelves, right? So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
No, that's right. I mean, totally right. But also, you know, I mean, this is one of the great things about like maybe BLO. I mean, how much connection they had. And this is why the Palestinian archive, it's, I mean, of course, there is the official one, which is was held by Palestinians or the, the BLO, which is was destroyed or stolen by the Israeli and maybe the other one, which is in Algeria. But you still find a lot of archive. I mean, I know a friend of me who just get a call from like Chaban and then he went and then they had a, a huge amount of like films from Palestine. So it's, it's, this is maybe the, re, the great things about this conf I mean, this conflict that it have many solidarity movement all over around the, the, the globe. So like you could like go to Italy. I was in Italy and then I was in art residency and I get a call from a guy who was like coming to this place where I was. And then he told me like he was in 70s in, 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 in a refugee camp near Bethlehem. And he was doing work there and he want to talk to me. I mean, of course I couldn't like talk to him too long because he don't speak English and then like we need to have someone to translate. But then he have some archive from that period because he was like part of this communist party in Italy and they want to do something with Palestine. So they moved to there. And then wherever you go, you find someone who did something with Palestine. You know, like there is a lot of history about it. Now I know like another Palestinian artist who do another project about like the, the Norwegian soldier before even the Nakba, they went to, uh, or before the 60 war, when they were like working in Gaza in, in 50s, 60s. So, and they have a lot of story just about Gaza. So like he's kind of collecting this materials, goes to this soldier working with the UN and just like collecting this materials about Gaza and about their stories with Gaza. So maybe this is what's the great things about it, that there is no state <laughs> that have this like system that you could go through it and just like you know as you said like it will be forgotten somewhere nobody will know it now it's everywhere so wherever you end up you find something and then as you said like the personal story behind it it's really really valuable and this is maybe one of the things about norway also like in a bigger scale i, I don't know like exactly but i i know the story of like some of the archive which is was uh, I, for the Oslo accord was missing and it's become a private and then like you go like to the personal and then did this work and then they want to show it to the public and they're willing to put it to everyone which is like it's also show you something about the society how i mean you know like how this works like you know like people do solidarity movement they're willing to give their works to show it to everyone but the state kind of like make it like hidden this archive and nobody can look at this what's happening during the Oslo Accord or some of it I mean not all of it for, for sure so like it's it's really interesting like things like to hear all the time I think what's very interesting also in what you're saying is that of course I mean we see that now also in so many places uh, wars are also really about kind of how history is told and the kind of the destruction of memory in a way of history of culture uh, of language at times so it's also really about systematically destroying the basis on which people claim their identity their sense of belonging all those kind of things so i think that that also makes this effort really really interesting as a kind of counter and and i feel that that's again where culture plays a really important role that it kind of recreates and uh, so you can create a story even though that archive that you're talking about is lost um, because you have a different uh, different access. But at the same time, from all these different lenses, which at times are also deeply problematic, obviously. Uh, so uh, kind of a Norwegian solidarity movement will go in. You're saying the, the Italian guy with the communist background, they will all come in from their particular angle, from their particular interest. Uh, so it's partial, but it's also... Uh, yeah, there's something also about this kind of insider-outsider aspects that uh, that are really, really interesting. But uh, but to me, that kind of um, tension between, on the one hand, this really systematic effort also to destroy, to destroy culture, to destroy history, to destroy memory, and then the, all these counter movements, which may be more often personal efforts rather than uh, on a national level. I have half a question in my head, but I'm not very eloquent, so I'm going to finish it as I speak. Um, this question is for you as an artist. Um, uh, um, I'm Mariam, and I wrote my uh, human rights thesis on the definition of a human rights defender. So I, um, so what, it, what, what does peace mean? Uh, what are the methods of fighting for peace? Is it, you know, 
differences, the way they see the differences between peace and violence, etc. But when I was interviewing the human rights defenders from different countries uh, who are um, uh, struggling at the moment, I was uh, struck by a certain thing. That is, I have read those conflicts uh, on paper from articles and stuff, but when I was talking to them in real life, and one of them broke down in front of me and started crying, that's when I actually felt something. I'm not saying that I'm not an empathetic person, but I'm saying that something actually happened to me when someone said it with a voice, with a face. My question to you is, uh, I understand the importance of uh, people seeing everything from a lot of pr different perspective, but do you think that somehow dilutes the message of people who are living through, living through it? So when you came to Norway and you were talking to other or meeting other artists, did you feel like they see it in a very clinical, dry way, whereas you have a, you have a, a life experience of it? Or do you think the role of art is exactly that? Because people are so desensitized, they're just reading stuff and not feeling much. So when you create a, an exhibition or something like that, or an atmosphere like that, people do have the heart-to-heart -heart connection like the project you make. How do you approach this um, subjectivity versus objectivity as an artist in this topic? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's... it's uh, well, I mean, it, it's a different, like, it, you know, it's kind of like a different from one to one, uh, of course. Uh, and when I came here to Norway, basically that was as an artist. I mean, I worked with journalists before, and then, like, my mind was working as a journalist, so I was, like, following, like, the journalist way, uh, even though I was studying art. And then my question was to the artist, like, doing art project, like, why you want to do this art project? It's just, like, saying nothing basically or like don't have any message to the people but then with time you start realizing that it's it's the effort that we put into that so like and the message that we want to tell so like it's not all the time we need to have a really like message a human message to the people that they want to know uh, but in this project, I would say, like, my personal things is just, like, okay, the personal level on it, it's the most important thing. So, like, I would go with that because that it will tell you as a person, like, how people work with that, what effort they did for it. So, but, but of course, like, as an, many different artists will do, have a different approach for it. It's not something, like, one line to do it. So, it's a... Uh, it's very hard to, to, to find a way uh, sometimes, uh, but uh, yeah, it's very hard to question. To be honest, it's just like <laughs> you know, but you know, like it's it's really like it's something. Sometimes you know, like with the Syrian refugees, it was like something touching me personally because I was like I was like almost a refugee. So like this is something that it was coming all the time, and I was like hearing about it, and then like it was like you know like how people look at us. Uh, and then, like, this solidarity, it have also this level. Like, I'm artist, I'm going around, and then people talk to me sometimes as a Palestinian. And then you feel this, like, conflict in that, you know, like, uh, you know, like you sit with them, and then you talk about Palestine, and then they ask a, a very, like, weirdy question about, like, you know, what do you think about Hamas? And, uh, like, nothing to do with it, or, like, with me. Like, it's just, like, why you need to ask me the question? Why you need to bring something is to the conversation in a strange way. So like, I felt like this also like it shows like people in Norway at like, you know, like there is Norwegian did this work for Palestine. This case have a different level. It's not just as you hear in the media all the time, you know, like, you know, Palestinian are terrorists and, you know, like don't touch them or like don't be close to them. Could I just very briefly, um to follow up on your question, as an academic, I, I work with um, life stories of refugees uh, and I write. And for me, I think I started working with artists when I saw an animation. This was a Syrian animator. Um, you watch it and you feel the fear, uh, which is something that I can never do with text because a lot of these things are actually not verbal they happen in the body, they happen to the body. So it's a communication on a totally different level. Uh, so I just wanted to add that, add that because for me, that's one of the reasons why I think it's so interesting to look at this kind of interplay with, um, with the arts because 
That's where there's something that academia can't do. Uh, my name is Rai Shotta. I'm an artist uh, from Sudan and Norway. <laughs> uh, uh, I guess I want to ask you, because you mentioned something early, after you finished your study, uh, your study in Norway, and then you went back home, and uh, you get residence in Norway, and you came back, after you went to the migration office, and you find out uh, what the, I forget, it's tasteless, and like, uh, it's like, it's really painful, like, because for me as a Sudanese, like the past four weeks, I'm really suffering, you know, even I'm asking myself, because I became a Norwegian, you know, and like, I felt like I have a two home, and I felt one home defending me, you know, because of the war, and the, the second home, it accepting me. But in the reality, like, uh, Scandinavian or Norway special, like they played a huge part, you know, before the uh, uh, before the suppression of the South Sudan, and um, and in two thousand in in nineteen eighty nine, like there is a, a Swedish company which work with the oil company called Loading, you know, and uh, they play a huge part, you know, to create that kind of of the civil war, yeah. and what I'm trying <laughs> to ask you, like, how did you manage, like, uh, to get over that kind of pain? I mean, you know, you still, I mean, you still, I mean, well, as a Palestinian, I still have it with me. I'm still stateless, even though I'm becoming a Norwegian, I have a Norwegian passport, but I'm still, like, a stateless, you know. I mean, this is maybe... Nobody have the same kind of idea when you're Palestinians and you have like a Norwegian passport now. But when I travel to Palestine, I mean, I, I cannot use the Norwegian passport. I'm not allowed even to use it. So I need to enter Palestine as a Palestinian. So um, I will be under the Israeli control. So they control me like I need to go through the checkpoint as any Palestinians. Because if I enter as a Norwegian, so I will get a visa. So that means I can go I'm inside or I can go anywhere, basically. But so they decided, no, I mean, you're Palestinian, so you need to be, to stay Palestinian. So you, when you come to the border, so like the Norwegian passport, you just put it in your bags and don't show it to anyone. This is, it's just for yourself. Uh, but even like, you know, this is a question of also like, I mean, you have the Norwegian passport, but I mean, I'm not sure, you know, like it's kind of, you use it when you travel, but you're still Palestinians and everybody look at you as a Palestinians. You know, like this is, it will have, the things always like you, you you will never get out of it like you will never become a Norwegian or like you have a Norwegian citizen but you're not fully Norwegian <laughs> uh, and the question will always comes to you you know like and, and they will ask the same questions all the time you know like you're Palestinians and Norwegian you're not Norwegian you know it's uh, and then you need to, to live with the pain you know you need to, to live with it and I I know that I have it with my kids now I mean they are Norwegian born in Norway but also they need to travel with me to Palestine so we need to make them a Palestinian passport to enter with me so I need to tell them every time why we need to go through this not to the airport and then you know my wife is from Jerusalem I'm from Bethlehem she go to Jerusalem I need to get a permission so you know like so the question it will will follow me all the time I'm not uh, it's like it's part of our life as a Palestinians I would say like it's like you will have it all the time with you yes thank you Ayman for the introduction and for your long journey in, in this mass we we all suffered um with the same uh, rules, regulations, and from country to country. It's the same for all Palestinians. Actually, I'm the Palestinian ambassador to Oslo. I'm Marie Antoinette Sedin. Um, I have two, uh, two things to, to mention here. Uh, let me start with the second part, because it was recently mentioned that with um, European citizenship or any other citizenship than Palestinians, even if you will use it, and get easy to have uh, the visa and um, the permission to enter through Israel to Palestine, you have to sign paper as European or as international guest. Like you are not going to Palestinian territories or you are not going to be in love with the Palestinian citizen. So this regulation just started two years ago 
and many people refuse to sign it. And if they, when they refuse to sign it, they are not allowed to enter. And even for pure Norwegian or originally Norwegian citizens, it's a lit little bit hard to enter through the Israeli regulations to come to Palestine in case your trip is to Palestine and not Israel. Uh, my, um, the main uh, introduction I want to add to your introductions and information that we lost big part of our archive. And um, as the uh, professor mentioned, um, Israel took big part of our archive from Lebanon in 82. We shipped some of the archives to Cyprus. It was lost in Cyprus. We're pretending that it's lost, but it's not lost. It was taken by someone. And uh, for some years ago, we started something called collecting Palestinian archives. We started from Oxford University by Dr. Nabilsi, and we started in Canada and the US, and now we have big part of the archive. And uh, just to inform you that we are planning to, uh, to save digitally this archive in Norway, actually. So we are pr preparing to save this digital uh, copy of our archive, not to be stolen, because every time Israel enter our ministries or our offices and attacking, uh, uh, confiscating all our information and material, so the things we are collecting, they are disappearing again. So Israel has the biggest Palestinian archive. I don't know when we can get it back, but with with Norius' help and other countries, maybe we can get. Thank you. I think um, we have to uh, stop here. I'm sure there's some time for informal questions afterwards, but uh, thank you so much, Ayman. It was a really uh, wonderful uh, contribution, and thank you to, uh, to all of you for the great questions and uh, your interest. Have a good evening.